Well, good morning. We're going to talk a little bit about grace later on in the sermon. Uh, so apparently I need a lot of it this morning. It's a good thing we're talking about it. Well, uh, we're on week three of our series, When Life Gives You Lemons, and I forgot to do something last week. I forgot to give out some lemons, so do not let me forget to do that this week. So we'll have lemons from last week to give out, and then lemons uh, today. They're not real, so don't worry. <laughs> that just means you get to keep them forever. That's the, that's the benefit. Well, again, we're on our third uh, week of this series. Next week is the last one. Um, and, and the first week, just kind of recap where we've been and where we're, we're going to be heading how first week we talked about how suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character produces hope. And last week we looked at Psalm 23 and how David had confidence in God in and through the valley. And this week we're looking at the Apostle Paul's ability to avoid becoming bitter and sour when life clearly gave him a big bowl of lemons that were bitter and sour. So the question this week for me as I was working through this was how do we avoid becoming bitter and sour when life gives us bitter and sour lemons? Or maybe a better question uh, was this. In those bitter and sour moments of life, how can we remain joyful and a thankful heart? Because to be honest, it's easy to be joyful and thankful when life is good, right? It's easy to walk around with a smile on your face you know, there's not many cares in the world that you have other than it's a good day. Your lemonade tastes amazing, and you're raking in the cash from your lemonade sale. I mean, life is good, right? And so it's easy to be joyful. It's easy to be thankful in those moments. But what about when life isn't good? What then? I mean, the smiles might seem a bit more difficult to muster up, and our emotions feel like they're a ticking time bomb. Or maybe you're like me, and it's like, the floodgates of tears could like crack open at any moment. And you're like sitting in the m movie of Avengers, the last one, and floodgates open. And you are a hot mess as you're walking out of that theater. <laughs> you know, those moments when life isn't so fun and, and joyful, we're a bit edgier, we tend to feel bitter about things that we didn't get, circumstances that seem to only happen to us. And when thinking about people that may have wronged us, we immediately want revenge and to see them slip on a banana peel or be the person that gets to sit in the long line of traffic when they're in a hurry. Right? You with me? You been there? I mean, let's just take a brief moment and be real with each other because there are indeed times in life when it is sour and bitter. And there are moments when life not only gives us a big bowl of lemons, but they're kind of rotten. I mean, it's as if we have entered the movie Alexander and the Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day, and it's on rewind because somebody wasn't kind. There's only a few of you that probably understood that one. VHS, you got a, it's on the box, it said, Be Kind, Rewind. I really liked that one. Or maybe it wasn't Alexander, but his friend Murphy brought his lawn to the mix, and anything that could possibly go wrong has, and then some, right? But even though we know that life isn't going to line up perfectly and be filled with sugar and spice and everything nice all the time, can you agree that it would be nice to not have life throw us a curveball? Just give us the fastball, right? So how in the midst of these kind of circumstances... Can we avoid becoming bitter and sour because it's really easy to do? It's easy to kind of hold ourselves up and be grumpy all the time because it's a little easier to muster up than those smiles, especially when life isn't fun. But how can we avoid that and instead be joyful and thankful even in the midst of the bitter and sour moments? And the more I got looking at this, there were a couple individuals biblically that came to mind and, and the Apostle Paul uh, kind of was the pinnacle person for me this week. And because if anybody knows about bad days, bitter and sour circumstances, and what it takes to be joyful and thankful in the midst of life happening, it was Paul. Now we need to understand that he wasn't superhuman. 
He wasn't someone that was filled with this incredible and special ability to overcome insurmountable odds and still come out smiling and smelling like roses. Paul is simply a sinner saved by the grace of God. And he refused to let anyone or anything steal the joy that he had in Jesus. See, Paul understood having a bad day. He knows what those are like. He understood how your entire week can fall apart on Monday. He, he understood the seasons of life that were filled with setbacks, difficulties, hardships, bitterness, and circumstances that leave people in not so good places. And yet, even in the midst of being chained to the wrist of a prison guard, Paul found the ability to be filled with joy and to be thankful in circumstances. And so we're going to look at his letter to the Philippians this morning. And what I love about uh, the, the letter to the Philippians is that you can almost feel Paul's joy and excitement. And, and it encourages me every time I read it. It encourages me on my not-so-good days. And I remember his words and I remember his joy and his thanksgiving. In fact, he opens up his letter to the Philippians. He says, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He didn't open it up with this disclaimer of like, I just got to tell you, my life really sucks right now. <laughs> I got this bowl of lemons that somebody gave me, and they're kind of rotten. I, I, just, I need you to know I'm not in a good place. Which he could have. But he didn't. He said, grace and peace to you. And then he says, I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for you, I always pray with joy. And so, if anybody's going to give us a little bit of a uh, lesson on what it means to be joyful and thankful in the midst of bitter and sour circumstances, it's Paul. Because he's got a pretty good handle on it. So we pick up his letter kind of towards the end in Philippians chapter 4. Now, at the beginning of chapter 4, Paul has just informed uh, the people in Philippi to rejoice always. To rejoice means that, that we're filled with joy, we celebrate, we're glad with delight in the Lord. Not just once, but at all times. And so, not only did Paul say rejoice always, he says, but don't be anxious about anything. Anybody anxious? Whew, yeah. I'm right there with you. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything through prayer and petition, give it to God. And he, he told the Philippians, he's like, look, if you do this, if you, if you kind of set your mind on these things, they, you will experience peace that transcends all understanding. And then he describes how to rejoice. Which, I don't know about you, there's some days that I'd rather bop somebody in the nose than rejoice. Or, this is one of my favorite uh, gifts, GIF, however you want to pronounce it. Uh, is this little girl? She's like my spirit child. <laughs> right? I mean, that's how I feel sometimes. I don't want to rejoice. I'd rather look like her. Taking a brush and going like this. Right? Paul says, look, when you're not feeling joyful, when you're not wanting to rejoice, don't think of those negative things. He tells the Philippians, he's like, think of the positive things. He said, instead of thinking of the bitter, sour lemonade, replace it with thoughts of something more positive. A cold glass of refreshing lemonade on that hot summer day, like yesterday. And so Paul begins by telling them and instructing them in chapter 4 of these things. To rejoice always. Don't think about all the negative stuff. Think about the positive things. And then in verse 10, it's here that we learn Paul's secret, his ability to be joyful and thankful even when life is bitter and sour. He says, I rejoice, again there's that word, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. So he kind of begins uh, this section of chapter 4 with this understanding of, he understands that the people in Philippi are concerned for him. I mean, he was literally in prison. And it's understandable how as friends of his, they might be concerned. And he says, but I'm not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, 
whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. So Paul wants the people and wants to make sure the people in Philippi knew that he wasn't looking for pity in this letter. He wasn't looking for anything like that. He wanted them to understand he was okay, even though he was in a horrible circumstance, chained to a prison guard. And this was crucial for them because soon they would come upon some hard times as a people. And Paul could kind of see that. And so he was directing them on, hey, it's going to not be so fun soon. You need to get a hold of this so you can remain joyful in who you are and in whose you are. And be able to remain thankful, even though life might be a little bitter and sour. You see, Paul was not in need because he learned to be content. Now, contentment is not really natural to most of us. It's something we have to learn. It's something that will take time. Learning to be content is not something that happens overnight. It's just like a, a child learning how to walk. They don't just all of a sudden, they're a baby, and then the next day they walk. I mean, it's a process because they have to learn. And, and learning to be content means sometimes we fall down just like a little kid falls down as they are learning how to walk. It's not just, a boom, you're good to go for the next time. So time and time again, life put Paul in circumstance after circumstance that were not so good. Circumstances that you and I would try to avoid at all costs and ones that we would definitely say were bitter and sour. Yet in the midst of those places, Paul figured out. He learned how to be content regardless of where he was at. Now we need to understand what Paul's talking about when he says he's learned to be content. In its very definition, content means to be in a state of peaceful happiness. Parents, we like our children in this state. Especially when they're sleeping. Right? We like our kids to be peaceful and happy and content. <laughs> and we want them to stay that way. However, when we say we are content, sometimes we jump to this idea of being comfortable. We're okay with where we're at. Which can often lead to not moving forward. We're content to stay where we are. So there's a big difference between the contentment Paul is talking about and being comfortably content. In fact, we often, you know, kind of talk against such contentment because when we are content in certain aspects of life, we fail to grow in our relationship with others and with God. We get stuck being mediocre and just good enough. And we never move, move towards greatness and those new things that are on the horizon. But the contentment that Paul speaks of is not something that can be satisfied by circumstance or material things. Often when we focus on those things to bring about our contentment, we usually end up being more discontented than anything else. Our true joy and contentment, our ability to be thankful and not bitter and sour, will never come from material things or outward circumstances. Never. Because at some point, those material things will disappoint and life will give us some terrible circumstance. So if we are depending on our joy and our contentment to come from material things, my iPhone, my brand new guitar that I bought Thursday, if I'm relying on that guitar alone, even though it's awfully pretty, <laughs> and it plays really nicely, if I'm relying on that thing to be my source of contentment in life, at some point the strings are going to go out of tune. At some point, a string may even break as I am in the middle of playing it. And my joy, my contentment is no longer there. And I'm now stuck in a bitter circumstance, mid-worship with nothing to play. So if I'm relying on that, if I'm relying on material things or circumstances, let's say, you know, this is the season of, you know, kind of getting married. I just celebrated our 14th wedding anniversary on the 9th. If I relied on that day to be my sole source of happiness and joy and contentment in life, it would have been not good six months later. Because that circumstance of that day changed. We've had some really awesome days in 14 years. We've had some really hard and difficult days in 14 years. And so our circumstances and our material things, we can't rely on those things to provide us the joy and contentment that Paul is talking about. Does that make sense? I sure hope so. <laughs> it's not in my notes, so sometimes when I do that, you know, it gets a little scary. 
You see, contentment is always an inside job. It has everything to do with what's going on on the inside of us, not what's on the outside. Contentment, true contentment has one source, the source that is found in a soul-satisfying relationship with Jesus, who cares for us and promises us to meet us and be with us in the valley and on the mountaintop. So true contentment is something that comes from God and God alone. This is the contentment that Paul speaks of. So when he says, I don't need anything because I've learned to be content, he describes a complete sufficiency and satisfaction in Christ. Not a self-sufficiency with the things of the world, but a complete sufficiency with Jesus. That's all he needs, regardless of the circumstance he's in or the bowl of lemons that he's been given. So how did he learn this contentment? Well, Paul learned to be content because he discovered his strength to get through the valley came from something or someone else. He says in Philippians 4.13, and some of you may already know what this is, he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Anybody heard that one? Yeah. So when I, uh, when I was a kid, um, this verse was like kind of my life verse. It was... I had Philippians 4.13 written on the side of my cleats. I had it uh, on the pad of my softball glove. I lined the brim of my hat with it. When I got confirmed uh, in the church, it was the verse I used to, to kind of define my life with Christ. It's a motivational, feel-good, win one, win one for the Gipper type of things. Steph Curry of the Golden State Warriors... He has it on his shoes. They've marketed this verse. Because it sounds really good, right? I can do all things. Because God's going to give me the strength to do it. As I was reading this, I thought, you know what? I think I've misinterpreted this verse for over 25 years. Because God can do all things. But I don't know that that's exactly how Paul was saying he's learned to be content. So hear me out. You see, I've always read this verse and not ever really the context around it, which I might add is a bit dangerous. You see, Paul isn't necessarily advocating that we can do everything right where we are when we feel like it. Paul's not saying that I can go out and win the Boston Marathon simply because I put 413 on my shoes and God's going to suddenly give me strength and lightning fast speed. You all know that's not happening. <laughs> you see, Paul is saying, look, regardless of my circumstance, I can do all things, including being content. I can do all things, including being thankful. I can do all things, including being filled with joy. I can do all things and make it through any circumstance, I can because God is giving me the strength. God is giving me the boldness and the confidence to take the next step, even when it's hard, frustrating, and unknown. Do you see the difference? Paul's saying we can do things, but he's relating his can do things and can, can make it through any situation back to his being in prison. He's saying, look, I've been in some terrible circumstances, and the only way that I can get through them is because God has given me the strength to do it. He's not saying, I can go out and win a marathon. So I think we need to start putting these verses together, because when we don't, we miss the point of I can do all things. Paul's saying, look, if you truly understood what I can do all things mean, you would be content when you entered the race to finish, even if it's dead last. And you would be okay. So we just need to kind of refocus how we see it. You see, when I look at 4.13, Philippians 4.13 in a different way, it completely changes how I see things. So when we say I can do everything through him who gives me strength, we are claiming that regardless of the good and bad, we can make it through. Regardless of the bitter and sour or sugar and spice, we will be content. We will find that sufficiency in Christ. Now, just because we may claim this and say it, 
doesn't mean that things aren't going to be painful. It doesn't mean that things are going to be easy because the reality is the situation and circumstance that we are relying on God to get us through, to give us the strength so we can make it through, may be the hardest thing we've ever faced. However, in the midst of the bad, because we have shifted our focus, our present circumstance, our strength is in the full sufficiency of Jesus. And we can proclaim, blessed be your name. And we can acknowledge that this may just be a bump in the road, albeit it might be a really big one. But it is just a bump in the road, and it's not the end. You see, Paul was God-sufficient, and nothing was going to get in the way of that. Nothing was going to get in the way of his joy in sharing it. So we're going to be done apparently really early, because I only have a few more things left. I want to leave you content and happy, right? <laughs> so in closing here, are a few things that you and I can do to remain joyful and thankful in the bitter and sour moments. Because it's really easy to jump and become bitter and sour when life is bitter and sour. So here are a few things uh, that you and I can do every day. So uh, if we have the next slide. So I found this picture randomly. And it has become one of my favorite images Mainly because it has swaggy in it, because I think it's pretty sweet. <laughs> but I thought, you know, as, as I'm working through this, I thought this is a great image to keep in mind. And these are great points to, to keep in mind to not allow ourselves to become bitter and sour when life is bitter and sour. So the first one is be kind. Be kind. When we are kind to others, it takes our focus off of us and our circumstances and puts it on someone else. You see, it's hard to be bitter and sour when we're focusing on being kind to other people. Have grace. See, I told you we'd get to grace. This is something that's really hard to do. Anybody struggle with giving grace to other people? Yep. You're human. <laughs> and that's okay. It's often hard, but you and I have had grace given to us, and it's important that we do the same for other people. So what this looks like is go easy on somebody else, right? People make mistakes. People trip up. They play their own notes in the middle of worship. They almost knock a coffee over. They say goofy things that they probably don't mean. Have grace. Because you and I have done those same things, right? Have grace. Because Lord help me, we sure need it. Give thanks. Find something daily to be thankful for. It will change your perspective. I heard someone speak at a conference and she said before her feet hit the floor every day, she wrote down five things that she was thankful for. I thought, wow, that's awesome. You know, and her, her whole idea was, look, it's hard to be bitter and sour when we're thinking of those things that we're thankful for. So I challenge you, tomorrow, before your feet hit the floor, and if you don't have a notepad beside your bed, take out your phone, because you probably have that beside your bed, and write it in a note. Like, start, start a note somewhere. Text it to somebody. Do, do something. One thing. We, we won't get to five yet. Write down one thing that you're thankful for. Because I guarantee if we start doing that on a daily basis, it will change our perspective for the whole day. Alright, so the what, fourth one is speak love. When we focus on speaking love into the lives of those around us, again, just like being kind, it's hard to be bitter and sour. In fact, we're going to do something. Are you ready? This is the participatory part of worship. Alright, if you have a phone with you, I want you to take it out. Now, if you were here probably about two months ago, we kind of did this. So I'm, I'm stealing it from Barry when he was here. So take out your phone. You got your phones? All right, I want you to find one person, text one person. Or I want you to open up Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or whatever you use. And I want you to uh, type these words, you are loved. That's it. Send it to somebody. And if you don't have your phone today or with you right now, I want you at some point today to send that to somebody or to post that because we don't speak enough love in the world anymore. Social media is proof. 
I love it, but yet sometimes it is the most depressing thing in the world. If we spoke more love and less hatred, imagine what would happen. There's, a, there's another quote floating around that said, you know, if speaking kindly to plants helps them grow, imagine what doing that to humans would do. Now, I don't know if that's true about plants, but, you know, the thought is in mind of, you know, imagine if, if we speak kind words, if we speak loving words to each other, imagine what that's going to do. It'll take away our grumpy faces and our, you know, little girl that waves her brush, right? Because I can't tell you, you are loved without a smile on my face and without it taking me out of my bitter and sour circumstance. All right, the last one is not up there. Oh, so I forgot to stay swaggy. I forgot the most fun one. Stay swaggy. <laughs> I actually had someone uh, message me yesterday. She said, stay swaggy, question mark, exclamation, question mark. And I said, yes, because swaggy, if you didn't know what swaggy means, I looked it up. According to the dictionary, it's having or displaying a very confident attitude or manner. I mean, if you just think about, you know, your swag, right? And what I love about this in relationship to what Paul was talking about in relationship to our series about, you know, lemonade and, and taking life and making it lemonade and all that good stuff, is that Paul was very confident. I mean, if you can imagine the Apostle Paul kind of walking around, I guarantee he had a swag to him. Because you can't go through life in the bitter and sour circumstances he's faced and be filled with joy and not have a swagger to you. And that swagger came from his confidence in who God was and what God was doing in his life. So this isn't, you know, a confidence that, you know, we're kind of cocky. It's a, it's a confidence in, in God is with us in and through the valley. So I want you to stay swaggy this week. Walk around with a certain tone and joy and smile. And when people say, what are you doing? I don't know, my goofy pastor told me to be swaggy, so I am, right? So according to this one, it's be kind, have grace, give thanks, speak love, and stay swaggy. And I added one more that's not up there. Don't let someone steal your joy. And I saw this the other day. Don't let someone dim your sparkle. And don't let somebody ruin your lemonade. Paul didn't let anything or anyone steal the joy that he had in Jesus. He didn't any, let anyone take those lemonades and ruin the lemonade that he was making. He didn't let anybody or any situation or anything dim the sparkle that he had in his eye when he talked about how good and amazing Jesus was in his life. Don't let anybody do that. Don't let anything, because there are going to be people out there that are going to try to ruin your day. I guarantee it. There are going to be people out there that are going to want to dim your sparkle. There are going to be people out there that are going to want to ruin your lemonade and tell you how bad it is. Don't let somebody do that. Because you control you. You control you. You control your actions, your emotions. You control how you feel. Don't let somebody take that away from you. Don't let somebody ruin your day. And I know this is much easier said than done. Amen? Amen? Because I've allowed many a thing, many a person, to steal my joy, dim my sparkle, and ruin my lemonade. And when I focus on trying to control them, right? When I focus on trying to control the fact that someone's making noise in worship, <laughs> just happens to be my brother-in-law, <laughs> so I can pick on him. When I try to control those things and something happens and I can't, I can't control it, then I get frustrated and it starts to ruin my day. When we focus on us and what we can control, being kind, 
having grace, giving thanks, speaking love, and having, having that swaggy confidence in following Jesus. No one or no thing can make us bitter or take our joy. You see, some of us here have had a time of it lately, haven't you? We've had chaos around us. The valley's been dark, and, and it would be really easy to go through life bitter and sour. And I'm sure some of you have every right to be bitter and sour. And that's okay, just don't stay there. At some point, moving forward through the circumstances, will mean learning to be content, finding joy and thankfulness, even in the midst of the sour situation. And at some point, we have to begin to squeeze out the lemons and let that bitter and sour feelings go. And we have to turn those thoughts into joy and sweet, refreshing lemonade that I've been told tastes really good today. So if we can do these things, we will have learned, as Paul did, to be content and not live with such bitterness, angst, sourness, but rather a joyful and thankful heart in all circumstances through the power that comes from Jesus Christ. All right, so your, your task this week, you're going to be kind. I know it's a tough one. You're going to be kind. You're going to have grace. You're going to give thanks. Do one tomorrow when you wake up. You're going to speak words of love to people. My favorite, you're going to stay swaggy. If you can send me or post a picture of you being swaggy this week, that'd be fantastic. <laughs> I'd give you something if you do that. And then the last one is you're not going to let anybody or anything steal your joy, dim your sparkle, or ruin your lemonade. Amen? Amen. All right, I'm going to pray, then we're going to play one more song, uh, and then you can have some lemonade and have a great rest of your Sunday. Sound good? All right, God, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the day. We thank you for the opportunity to walk through those valleys, because we know you are with us, and we know that ultimately those valleys teach us things. Father, we thank you for always being with us and helping to not let things steal our joy because our joy is found in you. Continue to give us the strength that we need to make it through the circumstance in the valley and the sour situation. And help us to learn to be content in your grace and your sufficiency and in your love. It is in your holy an awesome name that all God's people said. Amen. So now go in the grace and the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to be kind, to have grace, to give thanks, to speak love, to stay swaggy, and to not let anybody or anything steal the joy that you have in Jesus Christ. Go in peace. Amen. And amen. And if you want.